Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Reginald Adams, Chief Executive Officer and President of the Museum of Cultural Arts, Houston, which uses public art and creativity as tools for social awareness and community development. The organization was founded by Reginald Adams and Rhonda Radford Adams, both public artists, who combine their art making with a focus on engaging and uplifting community. Reginald Adams has generously agreed to share some of his thoughts with us. I'd like to thank you, Reginald, for joining us today. Glad to be here, Mark. Thank you. So the intersection of art and community, how did you combine your art making with the idea of creating an institution whose purpose is uh, to work at that intersection? Mark, what I recognized um, after about six years working in some inner city schools, community-based organizations, that a lot of the kids that I was coming in contact with uh, weren't going to our traditional art spaces. Uh, Houston is world renowned for some of its museums and, and galleries. But when you step into some of the inner city neighborhoods and you ask these kids, have they ever been to the MFA or to, or to the Manil Collection? Uh, surprisingly, many of them never have, and most of them have maybe even never heard of these spaces. And looking back on my own upbringing and, and how rich and diverse uh, my experience was going to the opera and to theater, and really it was just a part of uh, school. It was just something you take for granted. Um, I saw an opportunity, I saw a void, and in that void uh, was the opportunity for us to create the Museum of Cultural Arts Houston, which um, goes to those who can't come to us. And much of our work has been through designing and producing public art with those community kids. So when I step away and go back to my own neighborhood and uh, we've gone through the experience of creating a mural or sculpture in that child's uh, neighborhood, their community, they can take ownership. So whether they ever go to a traditional art space or not, they'll still have access and exposure to public art, to the arts. And the ownership that comes in them creating that work is what builds communities. In that explanation, you have a number of different elements. You first talk about your own experience, having attended uh, uh, performance, having uh, viewed museums, and your family's encouragement of that. So there's a family uh, piece of this. Absolutely. There's an experiential piece of creating art and having that be a meaningful experience and actually having the tools and the time and the resources to create art because art cannot be created with nothing. Um, it is created out of, out of thought and out of experience, but it also sometimes requires tools the whole idea of a community coming together of, of creating art, there, there are these different elements. Let's, let's break that down. Let's first talk about the children and, and their experience and their, and their family's experience. Do you feel that in, in certain respects in recent years we've become, as families, disconnected from the experience of art in community? Oh, it's, it's, it's no question. Um probably now more so than ever in our, in our school systems, in our educational systems, um, as, we, as our decision makers have to make really tough calls on where uh, limited resources are going. Uh, one of the first um, elements of the educational experience that gets removed are the arts. Are the arts. Right, okay, when, when t a principal has to make a call on whether you keep five math teachers, two science teachers, and a couple of art teachers, and all of the testing is around those math and sciences, right. the arts are the first to go, which, uh, which becomes uh, a limitation for these kids in the sense that if they're not getting it in schools and their parents have not experienced the value of the arts, then they're most likely not gonna have that creative opportunity, that opportunity to, to use their uh, analytical thought processes. You're experiencing a set of tasks that you have to learn. And the whole system is set up to teach you those set of tasks. You need to learn math, you need to learn how to write a grammatical sentence, but creativity, the act of creation, is the thing that falls out of the school system. That's right, and, and the piece that falls out is the, the glue that keeps it all together. So, so you travel and you talk to executives, and what I find when I speak to my peers uh, particularly those uh, in managerial or supervi supervisory positions, is what they're looking for now in the workforce are creative thinkers, okay? People who can think outside the box, who are quick to, to seek out a new solution, who can look around a problem and find a new way in which they address how to make that thing happen, 
um, those who we celebrate in our society are the most innovative, creative thinkers across the board, whether it's in the sciences or math or entertainment or athletics even. It's people who do something so different and so unique that it makes us awe. And we wonder, how did they do, how did they think of that? That's creativity at its finest. And so as a society, when we remove that creative function at a very early age, I think we're setting a society up for a very unproductive, non-creative workforce, which makes, makes us less competitive with the global community. So creative, creativity goes to the margins now, and the core is the non-creative rote learning that we need to do in order to pass our tests. The school systems are, as you say, facing some very severe budget restrictions. So in, in a sense, what we do by removing creativity, we remove some of the joy of the educational experience, and we leave there the, the absolute baseline that is required just to get people through the system and, and help them uh, acquire their basic skills. It becomes a, a vicious cycle. Um, I, just recently, the superintendent of, of Houston's public schools, one of the largest districts in the, in the country, was given a, um, a presentation on the challenges of keeping kids in school. And, and, and on one end, it's, it's about you know, keeping the standards high and getting kids to, to pass the test. But on the other end, he says, the, the teachers that keep the kids jazzed up are always the arts. It's music, it's dance, it's theater. And so um, we're removing what we know is keeping kids excited about school in order to fulfill this other part that is just simply about making sure these kids can or the, test. or the history teachers, or the math teachers, or the science teachers that that view their subject as as an art, as as something that that's is right because there's creativity in exciting, that as well. Right. Yeah, and so um, our work really is to to help supplant, complement what we know either it's not happening in the household, or not happening in the school systems uh, because it's it's fundamental when when we go through an experience where a kid comes into our studio or we go into the classroom and you know, I paint a picture first, I give them a vision that we're going to create this, whatever this is. And first of all, I hear, oh, I can't draw or I can't paint or I can't do this, that or the other. And and then we get into the experience of thinking through, talking through, figuring out how it's going to happen. And then we're at the stage of it's happening and they're seeing this work come to life, whatever the work is. And then we're at the point of celebrating the work because it's accomplished, it's completed, and we have the community out there celebrating and, and dignitaries and civic leaders there applauding these kids' uh, um, accomplishments, the pride and uh, the joy that comes from that experience simply validates why we have to do this work. And we have now close to 120 public art projects in, in the metropolitan area of Houston. And I've never gotten a call saying there's graffiti on this piece. Can you come and clean this up because somebody has vandalized it? Which speaks to another part of the value of this work and it's deprived that it, it, it holds, that somebody's taking care of this, somebody's looking after it. And it's the people living around it. It's not me, I'm not going out monitoring all this work, um, but, but it just drives me to continue doing more. So it's public art that's created by the public. We, we say we put the public back into public art. So now there's ownership of, uh, of the art and, and of the creative process. Now, once you own the art, then you may want to see other art. Oh, absolutely. No, actually, you will want to create more of it. You will want to find other ways to uh, exercise that creative muscle. Okay? The art is just the byproduct of, of creativity. Um, the more we exercise that muscle, like anything, you, you know, uh, an athlete, the more they, they, they lift the weights, the stronger their arms get, the, the more they can carry, the, the more they, they, they bench press. The, and the, the same way with creativity, the more you exercise that muscle, you find other facets of your life in which you can resolve issues quickly, differently. Uh, whether it's a, a personal issue in a relationship or an issue with, with, um, with, how to solve a new problem, but it's that creativity that we're really focused on um, massaging within these young people. So whatever the challenges are that they confront in, them li in their lives, they have a different way of looking at it. So in a sense, you're, you're coming full circle. The education system, the family, 
creation, the act of, of creating in public and displaying in public, and then the interest of your constituents in these cultural uh, assets and building those, those cultural assets up. It is a system that feeds itself. It really does. Uh, I've been very fortunate to have traveled all over the world studying public art, studying how societies uh, for the millenniums have used art to tell stories about religion and culture and science and math and politics. Um, when this is all said and done, thousands of years from now, they're not gonna find these notes. They're not gonna find these rags. Uh, however, what they will find are the remnants of these art pieces that we're creating. Um, we love to use mosaics in our work. And when people ask me, you know, Reginald, as an artist, what's your medium of choice? First is people. My medium of choice is people, because now the, the ideas that I envision, that I conceive, are so much bigger than what I can do on my own as a painter has to choose the right hues and pigments and a, uh, a chef has to choose the right herbs and spices to create the, the most idea entree. I have to now choose the right people to create these bigger public art projects. But even more fundamental than that, mosaics is what I love because it's so symbolic of our society. You take these, these broken, irregular shaped pieces of tile of different colors, much like we, and you put them together to create this idea image. And so we're able to tell these art stories, these history stories now. When you look at mosaics, they span all culture. You go anywhere around the world and you see mosaics. And some, in some cases, thousands of years old. And so I'm able to tell these kids that you're writing history. As we create this project, your children's children's children be able to come back one day and say, look at what great, great grandpa did when he was 12 years old. And it's very powerful, especially in a society where everything is quick, fast, turnover, you know, it gets old, throw it away, tear it down. Uh, but now these children are able to, to grow up seeing what they created on a regular basis. And again, it just builds a sense of uh, ownership that I haven't found anything else in my life that has given me that type of experience. Now, is the art then not just in the creation of the piece? Is the art also in bringing together people to conceive of the piece? Absolutely. Absolutely. The, the art just is be, it becomes a byproduct of an experience. If, if, if you give us enough time with a group, young or old, young at heart or youth, if you give us enough time and we have the right resources, art will be the byproduct of an experience. So you change the visual arts into a performance. Oh, it can be. Absolutely. We were asked to, to create a class project for a group of business leaders. They go through an organization called Leadership Houston and they take 50 business leaders through 10 months of leadership development as an as a end result of that 10 month experience, they have to create a class project together. And we were asked to, to come in and facilitate this mural and to see the, uh, the transformational changes that took place amongst these business leaders. Uh, one, they had to succumb to me. They had to yield. <laughs> they had to lend themselves to this idea of uh, of working in a way outside of what they're comfortable doing. They had to take some direction. And my direction is simply come with an open mind. You don't need to draw, you don't need to paint. We'll show you that. But follow this thread. And at the end of this, this, uh, this, this line that we draw will be this work of art that we'll all be able to celebrate. So fast forward 12 weeks later, and we're standing in front of a 36 foot by nine foot mosaic mural that depicts the diversity of the city. And the smiles, their children were there, their, their spouses, their partners were there, the, the mayor of Houston was there. And to see that, and to see how we're able to take this experience of creativity and pass it along to not just kids, because they need it, but our adults need it. Our business leaders need this creative experience. Um, it, it just lets me know that there's so much more work for us to do. And it binds people to the city. Nowadays, everything seems to be so transportable. You create a business to be transportable. That's right. and, and 15 minutes after the, there's a little bit of a price shift, you relocate to some other country or, or across the country. And that great American value of community is being sacrificed on, on the altar of, of self-interest. Yeah. 
so this process is is something that is done for the community and it and I think it reminds people that one is actually living also for others. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And and we have project after project where that same experience has, has unfolded right before our eyes. And uh, and to hear and talk to those participants, uh, it's very inspiring to hear them talk about um, where they were when they started and didn't think about this space, um, a vacant lot that was overlooked and overgrown, now hosting a sculpture that becomes a cultural destination. Oh, when you get to the intersection of this street and that street, there's a, there's a really tall mural there, turn right whereas that space otherwise was totally off the radar. And uh, that's the, the community development side of what we do as a very different museum. So you turn a vacant lot into an attraction. That's right, a cultural destination. And uh, we recognized, uh, my wife and I, uh, when we started MOCA 12 years ago, um, it was met with extreme criticism. Okay, we, 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 we started the museum out of the extra bedroom in our house. And the whole idea was to grow something. We knew that it was gonna be much larger than where we started. Um, and then to talk to people about the museum, well, your first um, ideas come to, where's your gallery? So that was the question, where's your gallery space? And, and we had to find a way to respond to that. So you know, the, the community is our canvas and the city is our gallery because we were creating these public, we had no interest in, and acquiring artifacts for you to come to us. We were fixed on going to those who could not come to these traditional museums. And now we do have a gallery space and we have a great production studio and we have all the traditional elements of a museum, but we haven't lost um, track, lost focus of what we started this for. And that was to bring these, these creative experience and bring the arts into these neighborhoods where we know if, these, if we don't do it, these kids are not going to come to the museum district. They're not going to come to River Oaks and, and visit some of the you know, nice galleries Houston has to offer. And so it, um, it's a need that we have been fulfilling. Now we've recognized that the need is beyond Houston. We're looking to go outside of Houston. Um, the need is global. We've now picked up a commission in Lyon, France, working with the Children's Cancer Center. I'll be leaving in a month to go do this work there. Uh, there's work that we just got in Austin, Texas. So now my thoughts are expanding beyond Houston community, even though I love the city. It's how do we touch other parts of our country, other parts of the world with these same creative uh, influences? What's interesting to me is that very often when I speak with, uh, with artists, one has this, this sense of a, such a strong vision that that vision needs to be followed and then presented, the audience in certain respects is of, is of no consequence. Whereas it seems that 12 years ago, when you were founding this organization, it was all about the audience. It was all about the engagement. I enjoyed studio work. I enjoyed going in, in my studio and painting, doing my thing. But the very first opportunity that I had to work with a group of kids on a mural, um, it was a community center in, in a, um, the north side of Houston, and it was a very small grant that I had received. It really didn't pay for the project, but you know I was going to do it. I was committed to making it happen. But Mark, the day that we dedicated this mural, and there were 50 kids who painted with me, and they painted the, the, the past, present, and future of their community. That was the whole imagery in the mural. And that, that afternoon, we're out at the park, and all the community is out. And when they unveil the mural and the, the cheers and the smiles and the laughter and the hugs that came from the community to those kids and then from those kids back, it was worth every penny. It was worth every drop of sweat that was put into working on that project. And that started to set my direction on my work, which was community-based. It was a quick shift for studio work. In fact, I almost stopped doing studio work at that point and really focused on looking for more opportunities to do what we're doing now. And that was even prior to MOCA being started, but it was one of the cornerstones to why MOCA exists now. Do you believe that this is the kind of situation where there are different approaches that need to be taken for different audiences uh, in order to engage them in the, in, in the arts and, and the thinking of art? I think, you know, 
the universe is so expansive that there's room for all of it, right? We just happen to feel, so the MFA feels a niche in our society. We need the MFAs of the world. We need the Manils. We need the contemporary arts museums. We need the local, the small, the grassroots, the treetops. We need it all because there's people that resonate at all levels. There's folks that have no interest in community-based public art. And that's great, but there's folks who need it. And so we just feel a void. Uh, we did not try to replicate or copy any other pre-existing organization. But what we have tried to do is redefine the role of a museum. We're recognizing some of our larger arts institutions, particularly the museums, are moving towards more community-based work. So we're, I'd like to think, helping them push the pendulum to speak to an audience that they otherwise were overlooking because, you know, they may have had their audience base targeted, their base was recognized. Um, but we do what we do so well and we do it so aggressively. I think that's the other part of being small is you're nimble, you can move and I don't have to go through a very long process in deciding on what projects we take on or not. Uh, I celebrate now going to some museums hosting community-based art programming. And I like to think that we're playing a part in them seeing the opportunities that are outside of folks coming through your own doors, but going out to those who, who need this uh, experience. Is there merit at this point to think about other alliance um, relationships, um, the cross-fertilization of boards, in order to bring these diverse communities um, into the, the consciousness of the leadership ranks of these institutions. What I've observed is uh, in, in this economic um, climate that we're in, it's forcing large and small organizations and institutions to get far more creative with their resources. You have, you have large museums thinking about selling off their collections in order to keep, keep the, the machine running, right? Uh, with these organizations have multi-million dollar endowments, but they're still trying to figure out how to sustain themselves. And, and certainly the smaller organizations are dealing with those same type of issues just on a smaller level. But what I have recognized, our groups are looking now more towards collaborative opportunities, collaborating on grants that are being written so that more resources can be spread across a broader base by groups working together instead of you getting your slice of the pie, you getting your slice. Well, now the pie has shifted. It's a different kind of pie. And as I see in the schools, as the resources shift where they're being disseminated, it creates really an opportunity it creates an opportunity to up for our organization leaders to get more creative on how we deliver our services and how we work with our partners. Um, we're creating a summer camp right now for an elementary school that has lost all of its art programming and had the funding been there, we wouldn't be brought together to do this work. So we're partnering with the Alley Theater and the Houston Ballet and the Conrad Johnson Foundation for the Arts, bringing the best art providers to this campus, but had the school received its funding, we wouldn't be at the table. So it's a private response to a deficit in, in a government funding system. That's right, that's right. And I see a lot of institutions responding that way. It's like, you know what? We're gonna do better together than by ourselves. And not everybody has that mindset, but uh, certainly we do. And because of our collaborative nature and how we produce our work, we lend ourselves to those type of collaborations. Well, Reginald, it is so wonderful to hear what you're doing and how you're changing the lives of people of all ages, of people of all communities, of all economic stature, and, and bringing the Houston community together in support of the Houston art scene. Thank you so much for sharing your insights and it will be fascinating to hear how you take this program, founded in Houston by yourself and your wife, uh, on the road and, and have this program affect other communities throughout Texas, throughout the nation, and throughout the world. Thank you, Mark, for the opportunity that you provide to us to share this story. Appreciate Thanks it. Thanks for your insights. My pleasure. Thank you very much.